Hi everyone, good evening and welcome to this investing class. I don't know what number we're on now, but it's we've had quite a few. And the point of today's class is Yahoo. But before we get into um, Yahoo, as usual, I'd like prepared some material for us to review together. And let's go find it. Uh, basically, I uh, wanted to review primary research. So we basically call uh, what we do fundamental research. We look into the details of a company and try to determine whether or not we want to make an investment based on, in essence, what is forecasting. So primary research is um, something that's pretty old. Uh, Phil Fisher's book, um, Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, uh, was sort of my first introduction to primary research. And then in the hedge fund industry, I saw a lot of primary research. And basically what primary research is, I guess one way to think of it is it's differentiated from secondary research. And um, I should probably put this, I'll put this in here, I guess, somewhere. Um, it's a good example. What makes something primary research? Well, secondary research is other people's research. And who would that be? Well, investment banks. other investors, news articles, things like that. Um, that's that's secondary, I guess, research. Um, so a buy rating from JP Morgan on a stock would be secondary research. And not, it's not just the buy rating itself, but it's the, you know, it's the so-called uh, channel check is one of the phrases people like to use, channel check. If you're not familiar with that term, I'd start to become familiar with it. Um, I should probably throw that in here somewhere. And there's a lot of different names for this. You know, we sometimes we'll say channel check, channel checks, due diligence, things like that. And basically, all it really means is interviewing people. It means talking to people. And those people can be inside of the company or outside of the company. And so if they're inside of the company, um, if there's a lot of rules in place. I'll give you an example. So we'll start with the senior management. Uh, in essence, if you uh, if you talk to the CEO, the CFO, the investor relations person, you have insider information rules that are, are pretty important. So anything you say or anything they say to you has to fall under sort of these um, rules. And yeah, absolutely, sell-side research shouldn't be trusted for a number of reasons, the least of which is there's a conflict of interest, but there's other reasons. So say you wanted to, to you know, scrutinize the growth possibilities of some company and you wanted to ask the CEO questions. Well, you know, generally speaking, I like to stay far, far away from what would be considered insider information, not because um, I don't want to know it, because it's not actually not important. Uh, back in the day, you'd uh, you'd ask, you know, uh, as many ways as possible. You'd want to ask, how is, you know, really current business going? And and the reason that this is, was such an important question is share prices react to to current business trends, I mean, principally, you know, what are the quarterly expectations for the business? And if the quarterly expectations are vastly above. They're coming in vastly, the quarterly results are coming in vastly above or vastly below the quarterly expectations. And that's something that's going to impact the share price. And there were funds that did this to an exquisitely good extent. You know, one example is Galleon. Uh, um, and their CEO is currently in prison. Um, and one of the reasons that this happened is if you, if the CEOs and CFOs and all these people give you insider information, and insider information is, is basically um, insider information is information which is material. Let's go. Let's go through this because it's important. Oops. Material in that anyone off the street would agree it is important. So it's just kind of a basic test. Uh, it is uh, non-public. No one knows. No one. Uh, it's not broadly known. And then finally, there's a breach. Of fiduciary, no breach of duty to not disclose. So you were sworn to secrecy or should have been. Basically, that means anytime you have this kind of information, 
you can't trade on it. And it turns out that you actually do end up getting this kind of information a lot in investing. And what you have to do is called restrict, restrict yourself. You have to not succumb to the temptation of insider trading. And as long as you do that, it's actually legal to have insider information, but it's illegal to trade on it. And so we're going to start with people inside of the company, the CEO, the CFO, investor relations. How do you talk to these people? Well, if you're a big shareholder, they kind of have to talk to you. There's no rule that specifically says they have to talk to you, but there's there's kind of a implicit uh, um, implicit expectation. Implicit expectation that they will talk to current and prospective shareholders. Now, what's interesting is you can be short the stock, and what happens when you're short is kind of unique. Um, you can imagine you can imagine um, being short a stock and uh, talking to the CEO and saying. Uh, the CEO may ask you, well, are you a shareholder of our company? And I don't know what you say. You say, well, not only am I not a shareholder, but I'm also short your stock. <laughs> That's something that might cause the CEO to hang up on you. Uh, if you're a good CEO, you might say, well, why are you short? This is why I think um, it's not a short. Or perhaps you'd even say, well, you know, we're a good company, but perhaps our stock is overvalued. And that does happen sometimes. So anyway, when you talk to the CEO, CFO, or IR, I typically don't like to ask about um, the current business. One is because it really makes it uncomfortable conversation. You know, and this this is obviously one of the reasons. The current the current business trends are supposed to be a secret until everyone knows them at the same time. That's quarterly, those are the quarterly um, results or the monthly results, etc. And getting access to them before anyone else has access to them is kind of uh, a dangerous thing to do. So I like to focus on long-term expectations because they're actually more important as we've seen in many of our models, the near-term results of uh, a company are less important than the long-term results of the company. Now, having said that, short-term results can be very indicative of long-term results. You, you know, a company has to have bad short-term results before they have bad long-term results. Uh, but even having bad short-term results could be just a pause in business or something like that. It may not necessarily presage the end of the company. In any in any event. Um, talking to people inside of the company is generally not thought to be channel checks. That's generally thought to sort of fall under the category of due diligence. Uh, due diligence is just sort of, um, you know, one of these things that, uh, um, you know, I guess you could say is sort of like sanctioned, sanctioned research. Uh, channel checking is sort of a little unsanctioned. The way, the way you do that, again, it's sort of as old as the day is long, but uh, it's talking to people outside of the company, or outside, or at least outside the company's senior management, without their senior management's knowledge. And so this includes people like salespeople at the company. And this is a, a pretty good way to get insider information. I think it's very dangerous, uh, and we don't want to necessarily do it. Um, you know, if you if you talk to someone who's the a top salesperson at uh, a top salesperson, say, at a drug company, they will actually know, they'll often know the quarterly trends for the whole company. And you don't want that information. Because generally speaking, if you trade on insider information, you will be caught, and, and not only is it unethical, but you will be caught, and, and you will have big problems. So. And it's again, it's not that important. You want to know about the long term, and 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 if you do get to talk to a top salesperson, it's better better to ask questions like, do you think that this product will really will sell? Uh, I don't know, five hundred million or one billion eventually. What do you think the reasons for and against are? That's a kind of a better question. Uh, something like, in your past experience in pharma, how does the culture of this company compare? Things like that. Now, those are those are easier questions than than something scary like, well, tell me exactly, is this a good quarter, <laughs> or was April or was March a good month 
for company X. That's not, you know, that's not, um, you know, a good thing. And of course, long-term projections are not easy to solve for anyone, but I think that asking some of these questions will give you clues. And remember, we're not always trying to be 100% accurate. No one can be that accurate. Uh, we're trying to get 55% of our investments right, or 60% of our investments right, um, not 100%, so keep that in mind. All right, and uh, it's funny because, um, you know, when you when you interview these people, there are a lot of techniques you can use, and there's uh, the kind of what to say is something that um, some people are very good at and some people are very bad at. And I even heard of hedge funds using CIA or KGB uh, interrogation methods to talk to their executives. And uh, there's a lot of funny, um, uh, there's a lot of funny kind of business that happens with that, including, um, you know, if, if you talk to the same executive for 10 years and, and one time they say, you know, uh, you know, I'm really nervous about our business. Well, what does that tell you? Do you have insider information or not? You know, that's a tricky situation. So I try to avoid situations like that. Um, I care about long-term business trends. But if you're in technology, the thing about technology is this, this really, um, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to make these investments without um, asking these kinds of questions. So it's just something to, to keep in mind. So people inside of the company, how do you get in touch with these people? Well, the top salesperson for Twitter, and Twitter does have salespeople, and Yahoo is salespeople, they may not necessarily just want to chat with you, right? They may not necessarily want to chat with you. Um, and sort of that's where we're having a network. You know, building your network is important. There's a, there's a, a huge um, advantage to sort of having um, a network of people that will talk to you. And if you want to be a tech investor, you have to have a network in tech investing. And if you want to be a healthcare investor, you have to have a network in healthcare investing. And this is one of the reasons why. And it's probably one of the reasons why it's easier to focus on one industry than another, because all your connections and contacts are all sort of people within uh, a few degrees of separation, and that makes sense. Um, so, uh, to you know, one of the big sort of dilemmas is to pay or not to pay. And um, you know, uh, should you pay? Should you pay? To pay your contacts or information? And this this sort of uh, is is a tricky one. You know, there are companies that Wall Street employs. Uh, the biggest one is called this Gerson Lerman Group. Uh, and they're a fantastic company. I, I've been a client of theirs for many, many years. And uh, Gerson Lerman Group will, for, for the right, for, for payments, will introduce you to people in, um, in the industry. So say, for example, it, it, it does sound shady, doesn't it? Um, So, so say for instance you're doing research on a certain industry and you need some consultants to help you understand that industry. This is what these services will do, and they'll pay I don't know a thousand dollars per hour to whomever to a consultant to teach you about the industry. And this eventually will morph into things like actually asking for information, uh, and you hope that it's not material non-public information. But some people actually abuse these uh, matchmaker services and get material non-public information, and this—that's illegal. And a lot of people were, a lot of people were um, um, arrested for doing that. So, in any event, um, that's something that's pretty important to think about. The, the other way is uh, to use things like LinkedIn or your personal network, and uh, sometimes we joke, joke, jokingly refer to that as smile. And dial. So we're using your charm to try to get information and, and important insights, and that's that's pretty typical. And again, chapter two of Phil Fisher's book goes through a lot of how to do this. And remember, this book was written in the fifties. Chapter two of Phil Fisher's Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. And and this is one of the cooler parts of investing because it's not very mathematical, it's not very technical. It's just simply being friendly and talking to people and. Um, you know, making, building a network and having people that like you. Uh, I'm not very good at any of that. Um, I'm just kidding, but um, that's something that uh, is crucial. So obviously there's all kinds of people that you could, you can uh, talk to. You can talk to uh, current employees, former employees, 
Um, let's see, competitors. So let's 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 do an example. Let's say I I want to make. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. How do I do this? It's amazing, huh? So let's say I wanted to make an investment in, or I was thinking about making an investment in alarm.com. So I'd actually do this, alarm.com LinkedIn. And I would actually go through this LinkedIn and I would search, it's only 500 employees, right? So I would actually search, how do I do this? I'm not logged into my LinkedIn, but uh, here we go. What you can do is you can go on LinkedIn and you can actually look up people that either work at, at uh, Alarm.com or used to work at Alarm.com. And you can take a look and say, well, maybe this person will connect with me. Maybe this person will connect with me and talk to me about the prospects for Alarm.com. Now, why would they do that? Well, sometimes, like I said, maybe you offer them some cash to, to discuss it with you. Maybe there are people that, uh, if they're former employees, maybe they're pretty hard up for cash. You just got to consider, you got to consider the fact that they may, um, you know, they may have a conflict of interest, or they may tell you something. If they were just fired, they might be upset. <laughs> um, this person is the chairman of Alarm.com. He's not going to talk to you most likely, unless you're a large investor or something like that. But the point is that that's you know sort of one of the ways to surf for people to talk to is LinkedIn's made it uh, a really good tool to look for employees to talk to and former employees and building your network is is not easy so anyway I thought that would be a good 10 20 minutes on on um, on uh, primary research and uh, one of the ways to do that surveys are the last thing I mentioned uh, actually Gerson Learning Group does do surveys they do them very cost effectively so you can survey hundreds of people, and you could survey just about anyone. Um, you could survey prospective alarm buyers uh, for alarm.com uh, and say, you know, how likely you build the survey. How likely are you to use alarm.com? Or and then you give them a list, you know, A, B, C. I don't know, competitor one, competitor two. And for, I don't know, $5,000, you can run this survey every quarter. If you really were going crazy, you can run it every month. And you could just say, um, you know, th that for $5,000, this is $20,000 a year, and you get this great survey. And say you wanted, I don't know, a sample size of five or 200 respondents. The more respondents you want, the more expensive it's going to be. And you can use SurveyMonkey or some other things. Um, so anyway, you have to... You, you can do as complex of a survey or as simple as a survey as you want, but I, I used a lot of surveys as an investor. Uh, and they're really cost effective, you know, for, for a relatively low amount of money. Uh, if you're gonna make a $5 million investment, you can afford the $20,000 it costs to do the survey. Uh, same thing with $1,000 per hour to 10, 10 current or former employees or competitors or industry experts or vendors, customers, buyers, supply chain, the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, that's how I would do it. So in any event, I'm just going to save that and um, we'll move on to Yahoo. I'll throw that all in the, uh, I'll throw that all in the uh, PowerPoint at some point and upload it. All right, so let's go to Yahoo. So I did my Yahoo model. I more or less got it done, but before we open it up, um, it's a $36 stock. I know that they're selling, they seem to want to sell the company and Verizon is rumored to be in the hunt to buy it. Uh, so the stock's $36 right now. It hasn't changed very much. Um, and what's really interesting about Yahoo is actually calculating how much cash or investment properties they have, which is a lot trickier than I thought it would be. So let me, let me explain that in a second.
Okay, so what was astonishing, and I have about 10, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 Yahoo models that y'all emailed me. And the best Yahoo model will actually get $1,000 PayPal, um, PayPal tonight from, from your none other. And uh, we will we'll see who did the best model. So maybe next time we do a model, maybe one of, one of y'all will do even better. Um, all right. So I bet that none of you got this right. I bet that none of you got this right. The thing, the, the sort of secret, I don't want to call it the secret, but one of the issues that I had with Yahoo is this little accounting thing that they did. And that's why, you know, some of you guys, it's funny, have seen, uh, have, have been watching the series, and, and, and some of you are very impatient. You say, okay, I, I know what a balance sheet is. Now let's move on to the next thing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, I know everything about balance sheets. Oh, slow down, buddy. Maybe you don't. Uh, and this is a good example. Uh, like I said, I think it's going to be 10 out of 10 people miss this on the balance sheet. And the trick is that some of these lines are trickier than you think. Uh, they're much trickier than you think. And here's, uh, here's why. So cash and equivalents here is $1.6 billion. And I'm going to actually sort of blow this up so we, we really kind of get a picture of it. So liquid, uh, let's just say sellable assets. So cash, cash is sellable, right? Cash is cash. Cash is, is pretty simple. So cash is 1631.911. So that's $1.6 billion, right? So cash is cash. That makes sense. Short-term marketable securities. Short-term marketable securities. That's probably what debt that will mature within one year. And that's $4,225,112,000. I'm just going to add it all up here. Something's up on my computer. Hang on. I just got this Excel 2016 that's already bugging on me. I'm going to tell Microsoft I'm the best Microsoft Excel user in the world. How dare you? How how dare you? All right. Come on. You can do it, buddy. All right. Well, that's sorting itself out using the enormous amount of processing speed that is required. I can tell you that accounts receivable is not a sellable asset. And there's some controversy as to whether or not it really is cash. What has happened again? This is so frustrating. Um, it, it's certainly not a sellable asset for our purposes. Prepaid expenses as well. I mean, these are things like post-it notes are, are in here. So we don't need to do these two. So so the current the current assets is done. So it's about, you know five to six billion dollars. This is really ridiculous. I have an Alienware, an i7, it should not be any issues. Let's see if there's a, a reason why this is happening. All right. So let's see. Long-term marketable securities: nine hundred seventy-five million nine hundred sixty-one. So this is probably, um, I don't know. This is probably bonds as well. Long-term marketable securities. All right. So let me try the sum one more time. No, it's it flips out if I try to do a formula. So strange, huh? All 
right. We'll, we'll manage. Um, property, plant, and equipment. You know, a lot of people like to think about this as sellable, but the thing is, old computers and old and you know, I mean, property is one thing. If you have office buildings, you know, so it's possible that some part of that 1.5 billion is sellable, like an office building or something like that. Um, but chances are, a good part of it is not. So the land, the land is often sellable. The goodwill and intangibles is obviously literally not sellable, right? Other long-term assets and investments. 342 million, so that's not that much. We could lump it in, it's gonna be a rounding error, right? 342 million. Okay, now here's the big kahuna. Alibaba. And they're telling you investment in Alibaba is worth 31,172,361. Did any of you actually do the calculation yourself? I doubt it. I doubt it. Because you're bums. See, look at this. This is the strangest thing with this Excel. I hope Bill Gates is watching. And Steve Ballmer. You should be ashamed of yourself. For this not good software. All right, top of the line computer. Take me five minutes to cut and paste something. Fascinating. All right, well, that's thinking. The next thing that they did is investments in equity interests. Now what could that be? 2.5 billion dollars. Investments in equity interest. No, this is a fresh install. It might be because I have like 15 of these files open. Holy smokes. No, I don't think it's that. My Excel is haunted. It's possible. It's only when I'm doing the formula. I think it's because I have all these files open. I've never had this many files open. Just be a pause in a second. Just be another minute. So the point I'm making is, um, hmm. let me close the file, maybe that'll help. Definitely weird. Am I running the 32-bit version? You think? I don't think so. I did just have to reinstall everything. I had Daquan hacked my computer again. I can't do anything right now, so I would love to try something, but there we go.
Daquan is a, a crazy hacker who loves to rampage in my computer systems. All right, so the point I'm making here is that you can't take this um, balance sheet for, for granted. Uh, you have to challenge some of these assumptions. You don't want to challenge everything that a company does. Like, for instance, the amount of cash that they have is probably correct. They probably do have $1.6 billion in cash. But once you get to some of these more interpretable line items, you have to be a little bit more cautious. So, this, for example, this is $31 billion. I, if you're going to just take it for granted, you might make some mistakes. Oh, here we go. Thank God. All right, let me get back to this lesson and open these and just minimize them. These are the models that I'll be criticizing later, tearing apart and picking the best one to win my money. It's not a big prize, $1,000, but you know, someone deserves cash for doing this. And it'll make, make it so that people will submit the model for the next round. Maybe it'll get more people to watch. I don't know. All right, so hopefully the it won't crash too much this time. And maybe I'll do that disabling or whatever that y'all suggested. Let's see. Options, advanced. How do I do this? All right. Okay. So back back where we left off. Investment and in equity interests. Two billion dollars. And so I sat here, and it's funny how these things kind of come up. Um, I was sitting here saying, all right, I get it. Yahoo isn't worth a lot. Because if you add it all up, um, this is 40, you know, roughly $40 billion. But, uh, and if you, if you look at the market cap, that's $34 billion. And if you look at the debt, that's thirteen billion dollars, right? Thirteen eight four five. So that means that um, the net cash is about twenty-seven billion dollars. The market cap is thirty-four billion dollars. But as I sat there and thought about it, um, I realized that there was a mistake. That the the balance sheet of Yahoo has a quote-unquote mistake. And I did all the math myself. I said, okay, I don't trust that this thirty-one billion is necessarily thirty-one billion. And I want to do my own analysis of it. And so uh, I went ahead and I went to uh, Alibaba uh, and I went to their 10K and I looked for Yahoo's holding in, in Alibaba and I looked at the Alibaba's market price. I looked at Alibaba's filings and I got pretty comfortable that you know the holding is worth something like $31 billion, more or less. Um, but then I went to the second one. And I found something fascinating. The investment in equity interest is not actually an investment in equity interest. All this is is Yahoo Japan. All this is is Yahoo Japan. And you'll find this is a frequent thing in SEC filings where they'll say investment in affiliate or something like that. But it really is an investment in, in this is a specific thing. They're calling it something else. They should just say investment in Yahoo Japan. But it really is, uh, uh, that's what it is. So I went ahead and I said, all right, well, is that worth two and a half billion? And sometimes people call this stress testing or you know, verifying or something like that. But I said, all right, well, Yahoo Japan, what, what is that worth? And it turns out, it turns out that they own 36% of Yahoo Japan. And Yahoo Japan is worth $23 billion. In fact, if you look at Yahoo Japan's market cap, it's one of the biggest tech companies in the world. It's worth $23 billion, and you don't even need an Excel to know that 35% of $23 billion is $8 billion. 
not two and a half billion. And Yahoo is carrying, in other words, they're marking this investment probably at cost. And the investment has quadrupled in value almost, three and a half times. So it's really worth eight billion. It's really worth eight billion, not two and a half billion. And if you do that math, you'll see that their actual cash is really 46 billion. 46 billion. So 35% of Yahoo Japan. But they're marking it as if it was worth 2.5 billion. So they're missing $6 billion, roughly $5.7 billion. So if you add that in, the enterprise value of Yahoo is pretty close to zero. It's $1.7 billion. And this is sort of a holding company, right? They have all these pieces. The biggest piece is Alibaba. The next piece is Yahoo Japan. And Yahoo Japan is six, they're marking it $6 billion less than what it's truly worth. And they can do that under accounting rules. And it's your job as an investor to say, hmm, is that $2 billion really $2 billion? Or is it actually $8 billion? And it is $8 billion. Now, if you wanted to buy Yahoo, it's kind of a pain in the neck because you have to buy this passive stake of Alibaba. You have to buy this passive stake of Yahoo Japan. And nobody, not even Warren Buffett, not even Warren Buffett wants to buy $40 billion. <laughs> I mean, this stuff is easy to liquidate, right? This is $7 billion of basically cash. You can get rid of that. That's, that's $7 billion. You buy $7 billion and sell it for $7 billion. That makes sense. I didn't find it in any footnotes. I just said, okay, this I get my head around. This is cash, marketable securities. Marketable securities have to be, have to be mark to market, right? So this is mark to market. This is just cash, cash derp. This is mark to market. This is whatever, three hundred million dollars, lols, whatever. That's not a lot. The Alibaba, I can check veracity of Alibaba myself. That's easy. And then now for the Yahoo Japan or this so-called investment in equity interests, 2.5 billion, I could say, okay, what the heck is that? Why do they have $2.5 billion of equity interest? What is it? And it is, of course, it is, it is Yahoo Japan. And then I look up how much do they own Yahoo Japan? And I'm shocked. I'm shocked to see they actually own eight billion dollars, eight billion dollars. Um, the mark to market accounting is is very uh, is a very traditional accounting. It's just simply the marketplace price for for certain bonds and things like that. So that's not that's very common and simple. Um, so in any event, the point is. Um, The point is that it understated it tremendously. And again, here I'm telling you that there's $40 billion, $39 billion of what are ultimately illiquid stakes. Liquid stakes. You might say, Martin, Alibaba, that's not an illiquid stock. The stock trades so much. Well, let's actually take a look. Let's take a look. Can you sell, can you sell $31 billion of Alibaba stock? Oh, let's go to Yahoo Finance and find out. How long would that take? Well, let's see. It trades 8 million shares a day. On average, it's about 13 million shares. All right. So $77 a share. It's been going, I think it's been going down, has it? Let's see. No, it's doing fine. 13 million shares a day. That's a billion dollars a day. Okay, you could actually get rid of the Alibaba stake in probably around 60 days, 90 days. But I don't know who would want to buy $31 billion of Alibaba stock. Why would you want to do that? And you, you buy it through Yahoo as opposed to buying it in the open market. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Why would you sign up for that illiquidity? Even if you could buy it for maybe 10% less or 5% less than the market price, all this really is is a very large block trade. And most people don't invest in, in buy companies for, for trading purposes. This is like a stock trade. No one would want to do that. Um, so the problem is that this Alibaba stock is ultimately just something that is almost cumbersome for Yahoo. It's, it's almost cumbersome. 
and the Yahoo Japan stake is even is even more liquid because Alibaba is only 15% of the company. For Yahoo Japan, it's literally 36% of the company. You can't just sell 36% of the company. It's it's very liquid, and nor is that of any strategic value to anyone. The only possible company is SoftBank that that could buy it, but. Even SoftBank, I'm not sure they want to do this. I mean, Goldman Sachs. I mean, who would want forty billion dollars of a liquid tech stocks? Uh, even Alibaba, one of the biggest tech stocks in the world, it's kind of an illiquid stake. It's not of much value. So basically, the way I look at it is, Yahoo has forty-six billion dollars of kind of crap in essence. A bunch of they're valued very valuable. It's worth forty-six billion dollars, but they're not valuable to anyone else uh, because you can't do anything with a piece of stocks, a piece of paper. Uh, you just sit there and watch it appreciate in value or depreciate in value, but it's not actually a strategic asset, so to speak. Uh, and so I guess SoftBank said they don't want it. There you go. Because, I mean, for obvious reasons. But So what we're left with here is a $2 billion or $1.7 billion stub of Yahoo. So that means Tumblr is worth $1.7 billion. Yahoo Finance, Yahoo Mail, Yahoo Sports, Polyvor, this thing that they just bought. If you actually look at the, the prices they paid for these, so let's see. Tumblr acquisition. They paid $1.1 billion for Tumblr. I don't know if that was all cash or not. So assuming that that was a fair value to pay, which it probably was not, the rest of Yahoo is worth not even... $600 million. Yahoo Finance, which is one of the most popular websites in the world, uh, some of the Yahoo News, uh, things like that. So, how did, you, how did we go through the rest of Yahoo? Well, what was remarkable to see is that Yahoo is actually this very unprofitable company. And um, if you look at the cash flow from operations, um, You can see that last 12 months, Yahoo lost $3 billion. $3 billion. And that's just cash flow from operations. So the question is, is there a turnaround that can take place that, that will inevitably result in Yahoo being a valuable property? Is there some fat here to cut that will, um, that will be valuable? And, and my impression is that even though you, know, you see Verizon is buying these other properties like AOL and things like that, it's, it seems like it's very difficult for Yahoo to generate cash flow. For instance, they're, they're saying that there's 700 to 800 million in EBITDA expected for 2016. Now, their CapEx looks like it averages, you know, 400, 500 million dollars. So maybe on a cash flow basis that they'll create 100 to 2 million or 200 million dollars in cash flow. I'm pretty skeptical of that. Um, I'm not so sure they would. And so, but let's take their, their word for it. Let's say they'll make 200 million dollars in cash flow. Now this is probably declining cash flow, although they insist it might not be declining, but if I give it a 10 times multiple, remember Tumblr is included in that. Tumblr is included in that. If I give it a 10 times multiple, I get $2 billion for the residual Yahoo properties. But even if I gave it 400, a 400 million in cash flow and a 15 times multiple, that's a $6 billion um, valuation. That's really sort of an outrageous this is sort of reasonable, but still sanguine. And so if I add the Yahoo business itself, Yahoo business itself. So here are the sellable assets, and here's the Yahoo business. The sellable assets are worth $46 billion. The Yahoo business, let's say it's worth $6 billion, because we want to be super friendly to Yahoo. $6 billion. So the total value of Yahoo, the total, and this is a really sanguine forecast. I, I don't think they're, I mean, last, last year they lost uh, $3 billion trying to run Yahoo, to $3 billion trying to run Yahoo. They went from making 800 to making 500 to losing $3 billion. Uh, and, and I don't know uh, how exactly that happened, but it happened. Um, so let's assume that the business is worth six billion dollars. Um, they're telling us that they're going to make, they're going to make, you know, something like a hundred million bucks next year, in 2016. I don't know that I believe that. My forecasts suggest that uh, they'd be lucky to do that. So the total value of Yahoo, if you include all the 
the assets and their actual business is $52 billion. The debt is 13 845 one, two, three. So the total net value, if you subtract the total value in the debt, is $38 billion. And that's assuming that Yahoo's base business is worth $6 billion, and we can agree that it probably isn't. So if we do that, we get a, a uh, if we subtract it or divide it by, by the 947 million shares outstanding, we get a $40 stock, a $41 stock. That is the best case scenario, right? That is the best case scenario. Uh, but if we put in the $2 billion, which is a little more reasonable for the Yahoo properties, I mean, you get Tumblr, which is, is probably worth, you know, maybe not $1.1 billion, but it's probably worth $500 million or something like that. Now, they mentioned that Tumblr did not do $100 million in revenue. It missed $100 million in revenue. So that tells me that's probably close to $100 million in revenue. That Tumblr is probably worth like a big multiple in revenue. So in any event, $2 billion seems, seems very reasonable. And in that case, you get $36 per share, which is um, right around the current stock price. So basically, it's 2% higher than the current stock price. If I put in $6 billion, that's 14% higher than the current stock price. No one makes... No one makes investments to make 14%. That's not a good enough investment. And furthermore, even if, even if um, this six billion number is right, why would you make this investment? Because sure, they can sell the rest of the business for six billion, but you still, all your own at that point is you own, instead of 1.6 billion in cash, you own 7.6 billion in cash, right? And you don't have the business anymore. So you can just imagine this goes to zero and this goes to 7.6. That's nice. But what about these stakes? They need to hire an investment bank, right? Like uh, Goldman Sachs to sell the Alibaba stake. But they've thought about that. They've tried that. They, they have thought about that really hard. And it's, it's a tough thing to do for tax reasons. And any time, if you know anything about Wall Street or anything about life, you know that if you try to sell 15% of, of something, and then you try to sell 36% of something, you're not going to get the same price as if you're going to try to sell 1% of that thing. It's easier to smell a, ti a tiny bit of it than to sell the entire enchilada because ultimately um, a buyer is going to say, well, if I'm going to take down the whole stake, I'm going to need a nice discount. I want a discount to the current price. And that means if you look at uh, these current mark-to-market prices, you probably have to take a small discount to them. They're liquid stocks, but they're not that liquid. Um, and and because a buyer who's going to buy them, maybe in the hopes of selling them later or just trading them very quickly, uh, it's going to need some kind of discount to, to take advantage of that. Even even a bank like Goldman Sachs would want a five percent discount or something like that. So ultimately, Yahoo is, is sort of a waste of time. I spent some time looking at these other things. Like they bought this company called Polyvor. And I think this is really fascinating. They paid $200 million to buy this company. And um, it's not really clear uh, to me why they did it. Um, I imagine it was Melissa Meyer's friend or something. But they, uh, they, it's, it's sort of this fashion website. It, in, natural, in addition to natural integrations with Yahoo Style and Yahoo Beauty, the problem I had with this is that they have these four verticals, news, sports, finance, and lifestyle. So I guess this falls under lifestyle. But they didn't tell us anything about the financials of Polyvore. Let's take a look. Um, let's take a look. So it's, is, it, is it an e-tailer? If it's an e-tailer, then that confuses me because um, I don't know if this is an attempt to get into to being an e-tailer or this is a... What, what exactly are we trying to do as Yahoo? And they spent $200 million in this business and $1.1 billion, uh, billion on Tumblr. I guess it's like a link. It's like an aggregator uh, for other... Uh, um, other, yeah, it looks like other websites, other fashion websites, which is great. Um, but, um, you know, it sort of, it sort of confused me, Polyvore. Then they have this Zobni and they have Flickr. 
Uh, so anyway, the properties are, are interesting, but the moves are a little bizarre. Um, they closed a couple of non-strategic, so Yahoo Games they're get, they got out of. Yahoo Screen was their attempt to look a little like Netflix. And they decided to get, um, they sort of decided to get a little smaller, um, which makes a lot of sense. It's focusing on, focusing on one thing is, is, is a reasonable way to create value, or a few things when you're focusing on, on, on a lot of different things, which Yahoo was sort of sprawling and difficult to, um, difficult to manage. So you could see someone like Verizon buy the whole company for a billion or two, and then shut down most of it and just keep Tumblr and just keep Yahoo Finance. Um, and that could make a lot of sense. There's this website that I used to go to where it's a, it's a website ranking. It's like, uh, there it is, Alexa.com. So if you look at uh, Alexa.com, you can see that Yahoo is the fifth, the fifth largest website. Okay, so Google and YouTube are number one and two. And these businesses are worth a lot. Facebook's worth a lot. Baidu is number four, and Baidu is worth a hundred uh, uh, fifty billion dollars. Okay, fifty billion dollars. And here's Yahoo at number five. Amazon is number six, and it's worth two hundred billion dollars. So Yahoo's still number five, and maybe that's because Yahoo Finance. Maybe that's because of Yahoo News. But all of these uh, here's Twitter at number ten, and Twitter's even lowly Twitter. Even lowly Twitter is worth eleven billion dollars. So it seemed it would seem to a value investor that two billion dollars for Yahoo is a really low number for for what it could what it is and what it could be, right? I mean, it really seems like it's possible that you could turn Yahoo around. Um, you see, Yahoo Japan is number sixteen. LinkedIn is up here up there. Uh, Yandex is a is a well known uh, search engine for Russia. eBay. So they're all valuable businesses, and Yahoo is number five. Number five. So it really is telling that uh, there's a chance that you know maybe maybe these properties are worth a lot more than you think. But even if if it were worth six billion dollars again, you don't get much of a pop in the stock. You don't get much of a pop in the stock. And it's hard to see anyone paying six billion dollars, signing up to lose to really lose all this money and potentially only make a hundred million dollars free cash flow. Well, that's not worth $6 billion. I mean, that's 60 times cash flow. That's hard to fathom. So in any event, I basically think that uh, the Yahoo isn't worth kind of exploring or worth looking at. In fact, if the stock went up a lot, I'd probably short it just because I think an illiquid stake in Alibaba and Yahoo Japan is going to have to be marked at a discount, say, um, say a 10% discount. And if you do that, Um, you know, you're definitely looking at, uh, remember if they're losing money and they're mismanaging their business, it's hard to, it's hard to see a ton of, of upside. Let's see. Yes, if it went up quite a bit in hopes of a successful sale, you could see the stock be really truly worth $32, in which case, you know, if the stock was at 40 or something like that, that's good downside. And you know it's not going anywhere on the upside, so I, I would short Yahoo if it went up to 40 bucks or something like that. So anyway, let's take a look at some of the models. Oh, let's make fun of them, because they're probably, probably terrible. All right, this guy, Rolfie, sends me this piece of garbage. Um, wow. Holy moly. I don't even know where to start. Search and display, okay. Competitors, Google, Facebook, Twitter, AOL, Microsoft, you don't say. He makes his growth column, but he doesn't put anything in there. Really, really helpful, I love that. Man, if you were working for me, I, whew, I would be uh, upset. The patents, I don't know if the, yeah, tech patents are generally, it's hard to see them being worth a lot, but you know. If, if Alibaba goes up 30%, the, the value will go up 30%. If, if Alibaba drops 30%, uh, the value of Yahoo will drop 30%. Okay. So, like, I, I like models that I can read. So, if you tried to print this out, I don't know what would happen. 
I would need like the world's largest page to read it. So um, good luck with that. Huh? I, I'm just conclusions over value. The share price of eight. Well, even even if you think Yahoo is worthless, just the Alibaba stock is worth is worth uh, thirty billion dollars, and he didn't put that in here. In fact, I don't see anything about the Alibaba assets. This guy totally misses the beat. He does all this work on on I'm not sure what exactly. Jesus Christ! I feel bad for this guy. He has a market model. I don't know what this is. Global ad revenue. Okay. Polyvore. What have I not researched? Their investment in Alibaba. Great, dude. It, it's not. There's nothing to research. If you own 15% of a company that's public, then you can just multiply their market cap by 15%, and that's what that's what that's worth. <laughs> There's nothing much to model. All right, Ralphie, I'm definitely not, uh, definitely not. Uh, good try, good try. A for effort for sure. But the main, the point of Yahoo is that on their balance sheet, there's this little, uh, there's this little thirty-one billion dollar thing that you probably should have paid attention to. All right, this guy Neil Sanford does a little bit better of a job. I don't know what font this is. Arial now or narrow? Just use Arial. That that's better. Uh, that's already bad mark there. Important info. What, what? I don't know. Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah, and can't you just like maybe do that? All right. So he also misses the beat. He thinks that Yahoo Japan is worth two point five billion dollars. He takes Yahoo's Yahoo Yahoo's. Uh, word for it, but if you just did a little research, you'd see that it's not worth 2.5 billion. It's actually worth 8 billion. So the enterprise value um, is uh, overstated. Um, and this is this is neat. You know, this is neat. The number of unique U.S. visitors to Yahoo. Now this makes it look really bad, but the reality is you still have 150 million unique visitors to Yahoo. So it's gone down, sure, but it's still a ton of a ton of unique visitors. I mean, that that's that's got to be valuable someday to somebody. And if you're Verizon, it, it sort of makes sense to 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 look at. Okay, so here you have it compared to Facebook. Now, yeah, Facebook super hot. Yahoo is the blue guy, which is dropping. But Yahoo's still more visited than Twitter. Look, Twitter's worth ten billion dollars. Maybe Twitter's overvalued. But Yahoo, you know, it's important to know if something is worth. Two billion or eight billion, right? You think Yahoo is worth eight billion, or the enterprise value is eight billion, and I think it's one point seven billion. If you came to me and said, "Martin, I want you to buy, um, uh, I want you to buy this real estate," and I said, "Oh, how much is it?" and you said eight million dollars, and I looked up the price and it was actually one point seven million dollars, I would not be very happy. I would probably never want to talk to you again. Well, that's how I feel about you now. Uh, the Yahoo Enterprise value is 1.7 billion, not not 7.8 billion. So that's a huge mistake. I mean, you could. I mean, I don't know how else to tell you, but these are two very different numbers. Let me just make sure you understand that. I don't know how much more I can blow it up, but if 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 someone said, "Hey, do you want to buy this business?" I don't know, man. So basically, if everything else in this model is worthless to look at, if you can't get that basic thing, and here, oh man, this is bad. Wow. Okay, I don't. This makes me not want to look at it. Ugly. All right, Neil Sanford. All right. So let me just make a, a list. Who was the first guy? Dalt Rolf. Who was the Who was the guy's name? I don't remember the first one we looked at. I'll give Neil a C minus. 
It's Rolfie, right? Rolfie? Rolfie gets an F. Because he didn't even add the Alibaba. That was that was terrible. Basically, and not an F. In fact, he gets he gets trash. He is basically gets the trash rating. Sorry, Rolfie, but you're a complete trash. Um Neil, alright, C minus. C minus. Forget doesn't okay. Yeah, I'll write comments. Eleven eleven gallon glad bag with drawstring and odor protection. Forgets that Yahoo Japan is actually worth eight billion dollars. Oh well, what's six billion between friends, right? Alright, let's see. Oh, and Terrible font. What is Ariel Narrow? All right. Yeah, no, he's just trash. I, I, it's not worth my time to review. All right, Michael Flanagan steps up to the plate. Let's see here. Let's see here. All right, he also makes the mistake. He just trusts Yahoo's number and doesn't realize that. There's an extra six billion up in there. I think he actually does the. Seems to do this. Seems to try to do the analysis of um, double checking the Alibaba. The problem is that Alibaba is worth 193 billion, not 129 billion. And this is a this is a classic mistake. Don't use Yahoo Finance for market caps, especially for international companies. Double check the market cap or Google Finance or anything for that matter. That was a, a huge mistake. Huge mistake. All right, let's see. At least the guy he gave him some points for using Arial. But uh, Yahoo Japan mistake fail epic fail trying to value Alibaba stake pity points were correct formatting. I haven't even seen the model page yet, so maybe I should reserve judgment. Okay, this isn't this isn't the end of the world. This isn't the easier on the eyes. But he doesn't include which ones are estimates and which ones are actuals. No estimate actual divider. Hmm. He, oh look at that. Includes impairment. Come on, bro. I give you a D. This is very close to being an F, but it's not trash. Yeah, this is this is actually not not terrible, not teller, not terrible. I don't know where you get a billion in Yahoo net income. They're they're not they're not ever gonna make net income, let alone a billion dollars. So lots of mistakes in here. Um, I mean, this is just ridiculous. You know, if Yahoo is gonna make a billion dollars a year someday, then I'd be a monkey's uncle, and uh, the company would be worth a lot more than what it's trading at. All right, Michael. Um, yeah, maybe I give you a, maybe I give you a C minus. Wasn't as bad as Neil Sanford's. It's kind of bad and worse, worse in some ways and better in other ways. All right, Louis, Louis de, de Maria, Louis de Maria. All right. All right. First of all. It's not zoom. It's eighty percent zoom. Second of all, he obviously misses the Alibaba, Alibaba, and and the uh, Yahoo Japan. He makes this whole sum up, sum up parts valuation, but doesn't do anything. What is this? What is this? This is like a this is like a empty promise. Oh, here's my sum of parts valuation. <laughs> it's a fucking empty piece of paper. <laughs> wow. Oh. Alibaba post tax, investments post tax. I guess he tries to do it here. Essentially, the only value about is its investment to other companies now. Good. But you missed the, the point of you didn't even bother to look into what this $1.6 billion investment was.
here's sort of a model, kind of. And apparently Yahoo's going to make a billion dollars next year. Or in two years. Cool. That's, uh, that's great. <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, I just can't understand where some of these numbers are coming from. I mean, their their own guidance for revenue, their guidance for 2016 revenue was 4.4 to 4.6. But you think it's going to be $5 billion. They're telling you they don't think it'll be more than $4.6 billion. I'm giving you a D. Just not good, not good. All right, look at this guy. Akshay Hey. Hey, he, hey. Wow. All right, so Akshay thinks that Yahoo doesn't care about Alibaba, the fact that they happen to own $30 billion of another company. But, no, it's not a big deal. Let's forget it. Who cares? Doesn't matter. Doesn't even calculate the debt right. They have thirteen billion dollars of debt. Well, I guess they don't have thirteen billion dollars of debt if they're not if they don't have Alibaba because that's tax most of its tax liability. Hmm. All right. Let's look at the model. The models apparently Yahoo is doing great. Uh, well, this is actually this is probably one of the better. This is one of the better models, at least in terms of what. I spoke too soon. Oh boy. Well, look, at least it, it's not a well constructed model, but at least it's a little more realistic in that it doesn't have Yahoo making gobs of money. Uh, it ignores it ignores CapEx and free cash flow, which is sort of problematic. I'm gonna give him an F. Not quite trash. Not quite trash. Well, just an F. Oh, there's the Bob. There's oh, here's Alibaba right here. There's Alibaba. Okay. So I'm just gonna give him a D minus. The core NPV is six billion. That's roughly what we were talking about, right? The high end, higher end. And look, he actually adds up how many shares that yeah of of Alibaba that they own. So that's pretty good. Then he adds them all up. That's not bad. That's not that bad. I'm going to give you a D plus. This is Yahoo Japan. LOL forecasting. All right. All right. Akshay. Good try. Good try for sure. All right. Steven Strohmeyer. Steven Strohmeyer. Let's take a look at this guy. All right. Including Alibaba stake, but still valuing Yahoo Japan at 2.5. I like how he copies and pastes the uh, all of the uh, management teams. That's kind of funny. All right, what is this? Main site. Okay, yes, it's Yahoo.com. All right. <laughs> IR site. That's not that bad. 10k. Business notes. These are okay. Modeling and opinion. All right, unique. General opinion, <laughs> short-term buy. Okay, all right, way to go. Um, NPV, oh my God, look at this. He's taking the value of cash flow from 2010 to 20 forever. But that's that cash flow is already gone. When you forecast cash flow, it's future cash flow, not past cash flow. I would love to forecast my cash, past cash flow. 
Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh man. Forecasting past cash flow. That's a first. I think my cat could do a better model than that. I'm supposed to be getting delivery of my cat tonight. He gets the uh, net cash all wrong because the Yahoo, uh, the uh, Yahoo Japan thing. The forecasts. He's just taking a guess. You know, he's got three percent growth. It's all good. Then all of a sudden, it's going to drop three percent a year. Nobody knows why. It is what it is. These costs. He's doing his best guess. That's a. I guess that's fine. He's got almost no operating income, which is about right. But now he's got equity income. Well, that doesn't make sense to me. Because unless they're not paying you a dividend, then you're including it in here. So I don't know about that. All right, dude, I'm giving you a D, D minus. Pretty bad. Pretty bad. All right. Got a couple more left. I thought I had 10. I might have deleted one by accident. No, no, I did six, so there's four left. That makes sense. I can't believe one of you guys is going to get anything. All right, Quinn. Quinn Lin Liang. All right, Quinn just uh, goes ham here and says that I mean, this is this is really amazing. Six billion in cash, one billion in debt. Nobody cares about Alibaba. What the? Oh my god! His NPV is a sum. It's actually the sum of cash flows. So it's not a discounted cash flow, it's just a summed cash flow. Holy moly. All right, well, this is uh, also trash. So this is like, a, I'd say a 13 gallon hefty, hefty bag with three holes in it carrying my old pizza. I'm carrying leftover pizza. Possible rat inside. That is your model, complete trash. All right, Matthew Vint. Matthew Vint. Let's see here. No force flex either. Yeah, I agree. Ah! Oh, this guy almost gets it. He writes 35.5% interest in Yahoo Japan, but he doesn't do the math. Oh, he's so close. So close. You can, you know what they say, you can lead a horse to water, right? Dude. Ah. Breaking my heart. Breaking my heart. So close. Right, let's check the model out. Yeah, look at that. He looks it looks closest to my model, which is the uh, that they're going to lose money and that the business is in kind of a permanent decline. Where's gross margins? Gross margins, he thinks, going to stay pretty steady around forty-five percent. All right. Total value. Oh, no, he gets it right. Look at that. Right there. 8.5 billion. Yahoo Japan. He got it. He got it. He found it. Yahoo Japan. Look at that. 
Liquidity premium. This guy's good. So he gets the total value of $35. And look, he adds it all up. He takes the core business is worth a billion. Sounds right. The Alibaba stakes were 23 billion. I don't know about that. Oh, he does he, he's using the marked stake. He's using the marked stake. And he shouldn't be using the marked stake. He should be using the 8 billion stake. And uh yeah, you know, either way, it's a tiny error there, but I'm giving this guy an A minus. Is are you in the room, Matthew Vint? That's pretty good. I will be giving you a stack of money like DJ Khaled. I mean, look, the market price for uh, Yahoo Japan is pretty clear. You just look up Yahoo Japan stock price, and it's a lot higher than what they're marking it at. That's like, I mean, you can't say you can't say that something is worth um, twenty-five percent of what it's trading for when it trades for that price every day for like five years. <laughs> You can't say, well, you know, I know it's trading for eight dollars, but I think it's worth two dollars. That that doesn't make sense. It's worth it's worth eight dollars. You could sell it for eight dollars right now. Um, you might not be able to sell all of it for eight dollars. Maybe some of it will sell for seven dollars. But come on, that doesn't make sense. Is he here? Is this man here, Matthew Ryan? Step forward, or Matthew Vent? Excuse me, Matthew Vent. That is pretty pretty good. Pretty good, I thought. You know, a couple cosmetic things, but you know, a cosmetic thing's not that important. I'm surprised he includes the goodwill in here. That's kind of a rookie mistake. Why include goodwill? That's not a cash flow item. It'd be really cool if he was like some college kid or something. Because this looks like a professional professional model. This is this look I really did a lot of research, huh? Very impressive. He really he gave up all of his look at this. All these thoughts. What is Alibaba? Eh, doesn't talk about Yahoo Japan much. Pretty impressive. No, he doesn't have to be here to claim the money. He did the hard work. He deserves it. All right, David F. David F. Now, Matthew's the guy to beat. Young people will probably not visit Yahoo because it feels old. What the? Come on. Come on. Come on. They want to get into esports, which, based on their press releases, which is a bad idea in my opinion. Okay. The company likes to invest. It's is it's it's like this means it is. Learn English. Okay. Tumblr is growing nicely. They said they would try to focus on less things, which is nice because most of the site is terrible. Yes, I agree. Uh, I don't even see him including Yahoo Japan in here. Uh, and he certainly doesn't pay attention to the tax liability, so he's got a negative EV. Well, he puts in Polyvore and Tumblr, which is nice. I'm not sure about the NPV part. Could you please talk about it some more? Well, 
when you try to calculate the value of something and you say you're not really sure how to calculate the value of something, you've got problems. Don't know about this since it gets weird. What the heck? Well, you know, the general sense of it is fine. You know, he thinks the Yahoo base business is not worth anything, which is probably true. Um, and he adds the cash. The cash is off, no doubt. Um, but, you know, it's not the worst in the world. Let's see. Matthew's here? Where is he? Someone said I won something. There we go. You, well, you certainly get to be the moderator. Congratulations. Um, all right, so I'm going to give this guy an F, but it's not, it's not trash. It's not trash. All right, let's see here. L-O-I. All right. This guy. So Matthew, yeah, tell us about yourself. Are you willing to go on Blab real quick, or are you uh, you want to stay? All right. You want to stay on chat only. Love to say hi face to face. I hope that's the real guy exactly, right? I'll, I'll make sure the account's not fake. Don't worry about that. All right, so this guy has no idea what the cash or debt of Yahoo is. I don't know. This is incredible. Okay, he sort of has the value. Ooh! Look at that. He actually gets Yahoo Japan correctly. We got the cash, NPV. This is actually not terrible. This is not terrible at all. It's sloppy, but this actually this gives uh this actually gives Matthew a run for its money. Why well, you haven't won yet, Matthew. There's still two left. This is actually pretty good. This is actually pretty good. Despite sloppiness, gets all of the core ideas correct. Yahoo Japan market price worth more than uh, booked price. Alibaba, low value of residual Yahoo business. That's pretty good. I'm going to give you a B plus, Loy. Who knows? Maybe there'll be a... I'll think about, you know, I'll think about a runner-up prize. I mean, there's a lot of mistakes in here and a lot of issues, but it's pretty good. i got to say, not bad. Not bad. And is that it? Is that 10? Oh, it felt like 10. Yeah, it's 10. All right, so the best one was Matthew. The second best one was Loy. Rolfi and Quinn were the, the trash ones. And just because you're trash today doesn't mean you will be, you'll be um, trash tomorrow. I mean, if I'd had to do this 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it would be trash rating. Guarantee it. And even 10 years ago, it would probably be close to trash. So don't feel bad. Practice makes perfect. You gotta, yeah, Mike, uh, C minus for sure. You know, I think uh, practice makes perfect. You know, um, there's definitely no, especially if this is one of the first, oops, I didn't mean to put you in timeout. <laughs> I meant to put you as a moderator, might be. Um, hmm. um, Um, one thousand dollars or whatever else you want of equivalent value. Um, 
Yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't feel discouraged if, even if you were trash, um, you know, even if you were a, a, a glad bag of trash that was rotting, you know, food, I wouldn't feel, um, I wouldn't feel uh, discouraged. Um, you know, it's, it's important to understand that a, a stock is a part of a business that has some value and all of the assets have to be accounted for correctly and carefully to determine the true value. Typically, it's going to be the future cash flow of the company. You've got to forecast, forecast that correctly. But in the meantime, uh, it's, it's also, um, you know, it's also uh, um, the other assets that the company has. So everyone should give themselves a round of applause for trying. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll give a prize to everyone, a consolation prize or something for, for even submitting the model. Um, but I thought that was, uh, and this isn't about how good Matthew clearly has done this before, but <clears throat> it's not, and it's not about the style. Remember, Loy's model was almost as good as Matthew's. You know, I prefer a neat model. And the reason that I'm really stringent about a neat model is because when you go to the real world, your boss wants a neat model. Your boss doesn't want to go cross-eyed looking at your crappy financials. He wants a really neat model, and ideally it should look the same every time. Um, no color, no big fonts, just really basic stripped-down financials is what I like. And for this exercise, I am your boss. So um, I thought um, the concepts are what matters, right? Um, so I thought, I thought there were a couple of good models in here, probably two really good models. And the rest, you know, there were some oversights. Definitely some oversights. Remember that the companies give guidance. So like Lewis's model had $5 billion in revenue for 2016. There were, um, the company's telling you that it's going to be $4 billion. So, um, okay. So maybe for next time, We'll do, what do you think, stamps.com? Let me start, let me start to do stamps.com. See if that's the one we want to look at. I need to email Matthew and stay in touch. Yeah, the you have to email me the model at shkrellymartin at gmail.com. All right, so stamps.com is $95 a share. It's earnings reporting season, isn't it? Well, the stock price doesn't make a difference, as we know. You go into the lessons, you know that it depends on the shares outstanding. And there probably have not many shares outstanding. There's 16.7 million shares outstanding. So that's about a billion dollar, billion and a half dollar company. Let's look at the financial statements. Yeah, not much cash. Some debt. Oh. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. This is definitely going to be a good one. So, stamps.com it is.
there it is. So hopefully that's clear. Um, and we'll do that. Oops. We'll do that uh, for next week's session. Same time, same place. Hope you guys learned something. Stamps.com prove, will prove to be pretty interesting. It's kind of a smaller company. So we've looked at most of the largest companies in tech, or at least in internet. We'll, I'll do this my own model. Um, and of course, I upload all of my models on the share drive. And the link's in the description box. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm going to do a lab real quick, so if you want to come in for Q&A, we'll do that. I'm going to stop recording now, so thanks for joining me, and we'll see you later.